super excited about this today's webinar. We'll just give it a couple of more minutes, right, Ben? Yep, sounds good. We, we should have people in before too long. Yep, takes everyone a minute to get in. It's always nice to see familiar names. Yeah, isn't it so exciting? <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't have everyone on um, speaking. So that's always like, oh, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> <laughs> right? I see your co-authors here, Andrea. Hey, Artie. The Horace and Magnus is here. Hey, Nicholas. Hey, Pinar. Hey, Sylvia. Right, 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 right. All right. Well, um, how about Ben that I just start presenting the form a little bit so that we don't lose a lot of time while <laughs> while everyone comes in. Uh, is that good timing, Ben? Are you okay with yeah, that? Perfect. Sounds good. All right. So while everyone is coming in, very, very welcome uh, to today's webinar. We are extraordinarily pleased to have our special guest stars, Martina and Javier, back here today with us. Um, we've only been running for a little over a year, um, but we already have encores uh, for some awesome presentations. So we're thrilled to have Martina and Javier back. back. But this time you'll be talking together at this, at this particular uh, webinar uh, and on 3D printing, which we know is a super hot topic. And nobody knows it um, better than you guys. Uh, so Javier, you will be presenting your paper that you just had out for the OECD. And Martina, she has definitely been in the weeds. We'll be hearing all about that. So very welcome to today's webinar. My name is Hannah Norberg and together with Ben Shepard. Ben, you might want to wave there. All right. <laughs> um, we host these monthly webinars at the TPR Forum Trade Policy Research Forum. As you can see from our logo, uh, where our, the idea behind us is to bridge the gap. So we want to bridge the gap between research and policy. And we also want to bridge the gap between um, policymakers and implementers uh, and regulators and all of those that are working in trade in different areas. So also in different areas of academics. So we try to tie together political scientists with economists, with lawyers and so on. Uh, and we're also excited to bridge the gap between generations and also between different parts of the country. Countries, actually. The world was what I was trying to say. Um, country, I live in Sweden, so that would just be you and me, Magnus. And, uh, so that's it. But at any rate, so very welcome to that. Um, so we are on Twitter, we are on LinkedIn, and we also have a website. So check out the website because we will be um, recording today's webinar and posting the recording as well as uh, the presentations there. And so if you want, if, uh, so that's a good place to catch up. Uh, join the LinkedIn group so that you can continue your conversations. Um, hop on Twitter. Uh, and for next year, we're going to have some really, really, really exciting news to share. So please come back in January. What did I miss, Ben? Uh, Jan January 20th is the next one. So we'll, we'll put up a slide about it and tell you a bit about it at the end of the webinar. And at that point, we will also have a, a lot more exciting news to share about the forum. If you want to get engaged, uh, if you want to help us out, or if you have topics, uh, or presenters that you would like to have, that you would ask, um, that you would like to see, let us know, because I will shamelessly ask anyone at any time to come to present for us. So without further ado, uh, I'm just going to leave it over to Javier from the OECD. Well, you guys can present yourselves so that I don't waste time, right? Um, when you have time, or perhaps, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Let me um, do the usual of sharing my screen. I hope that you could see it. So unless I see some violent objectives, then um, I'll assume that you can see it. So uh, my name is Javier Lopez Gonzalez. I'm a senior economist uh, in the OECD's Trade and Agriculture Directorate, and I'm responsible for the work on digital trade and cross-border data flows. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you about this work that we've done on 3D printing and international trade 
And I have to start with a big shout out to my co-author, Andrea Andrinelli, who has done uh, a lot of the very difficult work here and with whom we've been sort of laboring through many of these issues, but also uh, Juan Borras, who was uh, our research assistant and who helped us do uh, a lot of really cool stuff that I'll, I'll speak to you about a bit later on uh, during the presentation. Now, the OECD title for this is 3D Printing and International Trade. But the title that I wish I could have given this is How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love 3D Printing. And this is an allusion to uh, a really good uh, film by Stanley Kubrick, Dr. Strangelove. But in particular, it's an allusion to the fact that many people have been very worried about uh, 3D printing, in particular about the potential for 3D printing to disrupt international trade. Now, if you're sending a digital file across borders, then you wouldn't be sending the good across borders. So you get a relative replacement of goods trade by services trade, or perhaps not even if that file is being sent with no monetary value. So there's a lot of different questions. Why would you pay to transport an item when you can deliver it digitally? But I think the truth of the matter is that um, when you look at the, at the technology, you end up realizing that perhaps it's not such a big threat to international trade and that there are a lot of nuances. And so this paper is about trying to uh, look at different aspects of the technology to try and see whether we can tease out what trade policymakers should be concerned or not about in the evolving uh, environment. And so we do this across three main areas. The first part, is going to be about identifying the existing and emerging capabilities of the technology. So this is about, you know, what is it that the technology can do uh, to date? And what is it that the technology might be projected to do uh, in the near future? Perhaps not uh, in the future of Star Trek with, with, with replicators. And I'll speak a bit about that later on as well. The second element is to try and see what we can tell with existing data about the current trends in adoption. And that's a key problem here because uh, the data is very patchy. And so you have to proceed in, in terms of the analysis using proxy indicators. And then the third, the third bit is about the empirical identification of the linkages between the use of 3D printing technologies and uh, trade in 3D printable goods. And my understanding is that Martina will come in uh, because she has really great experience uh, on, on, on 3D printing. Um, I don't know if you want to say a word before you come in, Martina. Uh, thanks, Javier. Uh, perhaps just introducing myself so I don't jump in uh, straight without people knowing uh, who I am. Um, I, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the European University Institute in uh, Florence. Uh, and I work digital trade, uh, cross-border data flows, and uh, also I really like uh, digital things in general. So I have created an uh, association that provides digital education to schools in Sicily, and we provide the 3D printing classes uh, to kids and the teenagers. And also, uh, because I like these things a lot, uh, I also created a startup uh, on 3D printing for dentists. So I really yeah, have uh, get to know 3D printing by really using it uh, every day for a, a period of my life. So happy to provide the comments from that perspective. Thanks. Javier, can I just jump in here? Because I forgot to say something really important. Um, I forgot to tell people that this is a forum. So Ben and I were in charge of putting together these webinars and inviting awesome speakers like you two. But the forum will only be as good as the comments and the people who actually join in. So please, uh, since there's so many of us, we can't have everyone talking, but please use the um, the chat box and post your questions there and we will answer them either as we go along or Ben has one Ben's superpowers is to uh, to summarize questions uh, together. So please do that and join in on the fun. Thank you. So yeah, so let me start with sort of the first part of the presentation, which is about what we know about 3D printing technology and uh, international trade. And perhaps I can start with a bit of a brief history of additive manufacturing, which dates back to 1983. So, you know, it's not a technology that was born yesterday. And uh, Charles Hall uh, printed a cup using uh, bat polymerization and then patented this. And it was only in, in 1988 where the first commercial 3D printers came into use. And then 2004, where we started getting sort of the open source 3D printer project, which was uh, trying to uh, 
build a machine that would be able to replicate its own parts. And that was sort of a fixed deposition modeling type of machine. Um, but then we saw in 2008, 2009, uh, sort of the, the creation of open source repositories and the uh, patents on, on, on some of the 3D printers that, that came off, uh, which led to a very dramatic reduction in the cost of, of some machines and to a very big increase in sort of 3D printing uh, activity. This, if you want to, me to come in <laughs> on this slide, I just wanted to add the, uh, uh, the perspective of the maker movement, uh, which I think played a huge role in the democratization and application, wide application of 3D printing. Uh, and the maker movement, for those of you that don't know it, is really like a do-it-yourself movement that applies to technology. And it started to gain a real pace at the beginning of the year 2000. Um, and in 2002, there was their first class at MIT of a professor called Neil Geschenfeld, which is called, uh, the class was named How to Make Almost Anything. And it was a class that uh, made use of 3D printing and other digital fabrication technology to promote creativity. That was really the aim. In 2004, there was the Make Journal that came out. In 2005, the first Maker Fair. And uh, through all of this, then they also, the, the RepRap project started. And, uh, and this is a movement that now counts uh, thousands, I think, of maker spaces or fab labs all over the world. And these are all places where it's really easy um, and usually free uh, to get access to 3D printers. So I just wanted to add uh, this uh, dot on the graph. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. No, that's 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 really good. And I guess that for me, that raises sort of an issue which, which I want to highlight a bit later on about uh, the type of use that's given to 3D printing, whether it's more sort of a an individual use or, or a manufacturing and industrial use, which I think is something that, that matters in this area. Um, so let me just go quickly on sort of some of the main or different 3D printing technologies. So the one that we tend to be more familiar with, the one that's here presented in the bit of Yoda, which is material extrusion. And it's essentially where you sort of pass material through a nozzle, which is heated and then it's deposited layer by layer. That's sort of the additive element of additive manufacturing is that you know you build it like that rather than what might be subtractive manufacturing which is when you remove pieces and you cut them in all different areas the, the second type of approach is sort of the powder bed fusion which is where thermal energy is used to fuse different regions of a powder bed and so you know you have a region of a powder bed then you have some kind of uh, energy laser that that, that that heats it fuses it it comes down and then you add another layer and then the same thing happens and so forth. And then you have things like, such as VAT photopolymerization, which is a bit of a mouthful, and stereolithography, which is the process of using liquid resin and ultraviolet light to harden specific parts, creating solid elements of, of the object. And again, it's sort of something that is created layer by layer as it's brought uh, down and the laser uh, hits it. These are three ways of doing this. There's, of course, many other ways. Uh, Lovebrae University identifies seven key ways of, of proceeding. And as you can see, each uses different types of uh, materials, which will be uh, important. Um, maybe the other thing I want to highlight, and, and, and Martina can maybe attest to that from the user's uh, side, is that additive manufacturing is not sort of a, a, a click and obtain sort of uh, process. You know, we're very used to like printing papers and, you know, we click, we print and we consume them. Additive manufacturing requires quite a lot of complex steps. First of all, of course, is the design of the items themselves. But in particular, I want to highlight the model preparation using the, the slicing software and maybe the creation of the different supports, which can be uh, relatively uh, complicated. The slicing software is sort of something that um, tells you how the thing must be printed and with what temperature and at what speed so that you don't have problems. Um, then there's, of course, the machine preparation where you have to load the material itself and you have to make sure that everything is leveled out so that you, know, you don't get strange things. And also with respect to the supports that they're being kept properly. And then last, there's the printing itself, which can also have a number of problems. You know, nozzle jams, you can have different layers that shift, you can have over or under extrusion where, you know, too thin a layer or too thick a layer and things like that. And then at the very end, you get this product. 
And, you know, it looks really cool and it's very nice, but it still requires a bit more work. You know, many times you'll have to either remove the, the, the supports where you have to sand it, you might have to paint it, you have to polish it. And in many instances, because you're building complex things, you might even have to assemble it and glue it together. So, you know, we have this idea of a Star Trek replicator where we're going to get a, a CAD file and we're going to be able to print something finished. The, the reality is that, you know, it still requires a lot of work, both upstream, but also, also downstream to, to make sure that this is a, a final product. Um, and so maybe then turning to uh, sort of what additive manufacturing is best at, it's useful to uh, use this sort of unit cost framework to think about this. And what is the reality with 3D printing is that the unit costs, so how much it costs to build a unit, it costs building many units, tend to be relatively stable. I don't think they're a full horizontal line, largely because you know, there are some economies of scale for learning and things like that. But the reality is that relative to traditional manufacturing, uh, it's, it's very, very flat. And so what that implies is that there are some parts where additive manufacturing will be, will have a cost advantage and in other, other parts where traditional manufacturing will have cost advantages. And generally these depend on the complexity of what you're trying to build, uh, but also on how many units you need to deliver. Um, and sometimes, you know, the types of 3D printing products that can be printed are, are depend on the size and the capabilities of the material, but it's not because you can 3D print something that means that, you know, this is going to be the new way of doing things. My example of this is houses, which you can 3D print. I mean, there's still a lot of value of not 3D printing houses and you're not going to be 3D printing high rises. Uh, bridges is another example. And the other one, uh, which I like to allude to my, to my co-author is, is pizzas. You know, I'm sure you can print 3D print pizzas, but um, they're not going to be great. They're going to be gimmicky. You know, you're still going to get better pizzas from, from traditional uh, restaurants. So, so the technology is most often associated with manufacturing a smaller uh, geometrically complex objects of limited uh, materials. And maybe Martina could say a bit more about what other cool stuff can be 3D printed. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks. On, on this, I wanted to just give an overview of how I see 3D printing in different areas, because really there are, uh, as you said, also different types of 3D printing, uh, different approaches, different materials, and there's even bioprinting, which is a, a printing with the uh, organic material, like uh, skins, or there's also now testing of organs, um, even for pharmaceutical, they're testing it. Uh, and there is food printing, as you said, very uh, weird and very rare. Uh, is mostly just to give shapes to things. And, and then there are uh, the most used 3D printing um, uh, technologies, which use plastic, uh, resin and metal. Um, so if we just want to uh, give an overview, there is uh, uh, the industrial applications are very limited and they mainly have to do, first of all, with the things that uh, have value in being customized. This is the main value added of 3D printing because, of course, when you customize something and then you have it to adapt it, for example, to the anatomy of a person, then each product is different. So there is huge applications in prosthetics, uh, dentistry. Uh, when it comes to the aligners, maybe you have heard about Invisalign is becoming huge. These are all 3D printed uh, aligners, uh, but also surgical guides that are uh, 3D printed in the dental office or uh, sometimes ship, uh, uh, shipped by the company to then uh, do a surgery. Uh, Earring aids, you know, they're all being uh, 3D printed. Um, and yeah, and this is generally some applications uh, when it comes to customization. Uh, then uh, there is all the complexity. Uh, 3D printing can help to create things which are very complex, which will be hard to make with traditional manufacturing. And the main applications in this area have to do with fashion. So jewelry, for example, but also uh, you can think of glasses. Uh, there are several frames of glasses which are 3D printed. And in that case, also they have to do with the customization um, and to follow the, the anatomy uh, of the person. Um, uh, yeah, and these are some of the examples, but you can think also about shoes, uh, for example. Uh, and then uh, for industrial applications, the metal uh, applications are very important and they have to do with waste um, because when uh, you use um, traditional manufacturing, so subtracting manufacturing, you're starting from a block and eliminate metal to create, for example, nozzles or other material, metal objects. 
while we 3 printing, you only use the metal you need for creating that specific object. Um, so uh, General Electric, for example, is using uh, metal 3D printing for nozzles, and they est estimated that you can save up to 90% of material. So, so when it comes to industrial applications, it's really customization, complexity of shapes, and uh, uh, redu reduction of waste. Then uh, there is all the issue of inventory. Um, so when you are in very far places or when there is a lot of waste of inventory, um, you can uh, consider to use 3D printing on the spot. Uh, and the uh, most interesting application, of course, is 3D printing in space because it's very hard to, to ship something to space if something breaks. So there is, a, uh, if you Google, you will find some newspaper articles that talk about how uh, astronauts use 3D printing uh, on space. Um, and then uh, when it comes to business still, uh, interesting applications have to do with prototyping, of course, uh, creating new uh, uh, innovative ideas and product validation. So if you have some new business idea, you can easily tweak the 3D model, test something uh, and keep testing uh, uh, without uh, the need to create molds and uh, and uh, waste time and uh, and money for those. Uh, and then once you have a final product, you can print maybe the, the first 100, 200 products to do a market validation. And then if it works, go to traditional manufacturing. So this is, I think, uh, like a broad perspective on the applications in industry. And then usually I always talk about the ABC of 3D printing because there is a, a B is business, A is academics, academia, because uh, there is a very interesting applications of 3D printing and 3D modeling in uh, um, schools and universities. So now uh, maker spaces are becoming very common, for example, in uh, uh, design, architecture, engineering universities, but also in school. Uh, and then this, uh, and, and also you can, of course, use uh, um, uh, these uh, uh, machines for skilling and reskilling. Uh, so still uh, for uh, when it comes to uh, training and education. And then the C uh, states for, uh, is for community because there is also interesting community applications, so social uh, projects, uh, so to fix stuff. Uh, there's interesting applications in Africa, for example, in Fab Labs, uh, to use 3D printing to just uh, um, fix stuff. Uh, there's the famous uh, repair cafe. So you can go there and bring something which is broken and then 3D print, 3D print the part that can fix um, uh, a vacuum cleaner, for example. And this is what we also do in our Fab Lab sometimes. Just if someone uh, is to replace a washing machine or a vacuum cleaner, um, maybe just by printing a small piece, they can just fix. Uh, the object instead of throwing it away um, and this of course uh, sometimes requires other things uh, together with 3d printing and usually in uh, maker spaces you find also the additional skills uh, you need so yeah this is just to give a broad overview of all potential applications of 3d printing from business to uh, community how cool is that <laughs> sorry that's very really cool um so, so, I mean, maybe bring it back to sort of a discussion that is more on the trade side. Um, clearly, the impact that this will have on trade is going to depend on the scope of what is being 3D printed, out of, you know, what can be 3D printed, but also, I think, importantly, on how the technology is deployed. And so when we look at the engineering literature and the literature on the industry, what we find is two uh, different types of deployments. There's concentrated manufacturing and there's distributed uh, manufacturing. And clearly concentrated manufacturing, uh, which is where you have sort of hubs, which then ship uh, to different consumers in different countries, means that there could be more trade. It would be largely trade enhancing. But when it's distributed manufacturing and it's the 3D printers, which are located closer to the consumers, then there is more of a danger that trade might be replaced. Notwithstanding also though, that you need to take into account that the ink itself, so the materials still need to come from somewhere. So it might be trade in that sense, but also that there might be trade in the context of services. Uh, and so even when you think that, you know, 3D printing might uh, substitute fully for, for trade, you need to take into account all the different parts of the value chain to make a proper assessment on whether we should or shouldn't be worried about a full replacement or substitution uh, through, through 3D printing. I don't know if you wanted to add something, Martina. Uh, very quickly, this just, uh, 
uh, adding to what I was saying before about fab labs and maker spaces, which are really uh, spread all, all over the world, uh, usually uh, you have at least one of these maker spaces in big uh, cities or like above 100,000 citizens, you will find a maker space. Um, so uh, I think maker spaces play a huge role in this distributed manufacturing because uh, people, instead of having to buy their own 3D printer, they just go to these places and they pay per print. These are also called print shops somewhere. It depends. There are different types of maker spaces. Um, so this uh, can be uh, the uh, place that uh, allows to, to distribute for uh, manufacturing. But of course, you have to take into account that uh, by creating these spaces, you're also creating jobs uh, because uh, you have to have someone that actually creates the thing. Uh, so you're also creating value in the country. Uh, and when you produce the goods, of course, it's always going to pass through someone uh, that is nationally located. And that's to have also the skills uh, to transform the file, which is an STL, into a 3D printed product. And maybe perhaps to add from the industrial side, one thing that became very evident when we were looking at this is that there are quite strong costs to the machinery itself, but also to maintaining that machinery and to the skills needed to operate that machinery. So there's sort of centripetal and centrifugal forces at play. Uh, one thing that we might think about is that maybe a lot of the industrial application can be uh, on concentrated manufacturing and maybe a lot of other applications arise in distributed manufacturing, but this is going to matter. But I think the bottom line here is that uh, cost and quality advantages of traditional manufacturing are going to remain for, for a number of products. And so, uh, you know, the fact that the idea that the 3D printing is going to take over every single product is, is again, perhaps uh, a little uh, far-fetched. Um, let, me, let me turn quickly to sort of the existing data that we have on mapping the landscape. And perhaps first say that, you know, from the empirical analysis side, the big problem here is that there's very little publicly available uh, data, whether on 3D printing technology adoption and diffusion, but in particular on the trade side, on trade printers, on the items that can be 3D printed, and also on the materials that are uh, used to, to 3D print. And so we rely on specialized industry reports, such as the Rolux reports, which are useful, but generally do not give us a good indication of the cross-border elements. So to capture these, we need to proceed uh, using different types of proxies. One of the key challenges is that to date, there is no specific HS code for 3D printers. Uh, they're gonna create one in 2022 uh, in the new update. So that's something to look forward to, and that's gonna be very useful for future analysis. Uh, but to date, we have to use this code, which is HS857780, uh, which is what the WCO suggests where we should uh, classify uh, 3D uh, printers. And this is also confirmed by some of the work done by Avalansky and co-authors, which asked customs authorities where they were classifying these. Now, the issue, as you will see from the description, is that this is largely related to rubber and plastic machines, rather than some of the other stuff that Martina was mentioning, which might be other materials that are being used uh, in this area. So, but in the absence of better data, this is, this is what have. Um, my first observation on this is that trade in 3D printers is growing, but it's been growing nothing amazing, just at the, the very similar pace to traditional trade. So we, you know, we are seeing something there, but nothing, nothing really dramatic. You know, we'd like to report really big rises in 3D printing, but we are not necessarily seeing them. Um, but we do see concentration. Uh, in terms of exports, concentration is largely uh, in uh, OECD countries, in Germany, in Italy, Japan, Austria, uh, United States. Um, but we see that imports are less concentrated and becoming less concentrated in time and largely involve non-OECD countries. We have China, India, Vietnam, uh, and uh, Thailand, Nigeria, Indonesia, they're key importers. And we have this category here of, of, of other countries as well. So we're seeing concentration of the, the development of the technology, but maybe access to the technology via international trade, which is something that we want to capture in our empirical specification. In terms of trade and materials used for 3D printing, Martina mentioned a few of these, the polymers, the ceramics, the paper, the metals. We also see quite a bit of concentration. So if this really does pick up, then it will reinforce these existing trends. Concentration in the US, in China, Indonesia, Russia, uh, 
Canada, Norway, Brazil. So the, the usual suspect in terms of uh, natural resource producers. That's where we might see a, a, an impact going forward. Javier, sorry, oh. just just quickly, uh, maybe you have some problem with the, your headphones because we hear your voice going up and down. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I'm sorry, I don't know what to do about it. Um, is, okay. Is that, is that a bit better if I'm a bit further away? Is that better or not? We can or see because it happens now and then. So I just wanted to, uh, yeah, to make sure. My, my computer doesn't like me. That's what, that's what this is. <laughs> I'll try and speak slower so that we don't... Um, Um, so basically what we do is we look at trade in 3D printable goods and we identify 3D printable goods in this instance through uh, a paper uh, done uh, by the World Bank or in, by the, funded by the World Bank. And these are industrial products that could be 3D printable that can be categorized according to different uh, sort of areas, sort of low tech, uh, medium tech, orthopedic appliances or uh, um, what was the other one? Air, air um, I think it's um, things related to air transport and air turbines. And clearly what you see is that a lot of these 3D printable products have followed a similar trend to total trade, which is over here. But the ones that have really picked up are the orthopedic equipment, the ones that Martina was saying. That this is where there's been a really strong adoption, a very wide adoption, but if 3D printing was substituting trade, we would expect a big fall because they would be you know, delivered digitally, not in the trade statistics. But the trade statistics themselves suggest that maybe this is not a, a trade substituting technology, but maybe a trade enhancing technology, or at least there's a possibility that, that it might be. Um, the fourth observation I want to highlight is that OECD countries are uh, leading innovators uh, according to the OECD uh, patent statistics. We have United States, we have Japan, Germany, and Chinese Taipei. Again, a lot of concentration uh, in, uh, in, the, in the development of this, uh, but also a lot of uh, very different uses for, for 3D printing technology, as we see from data from FactSet, from the medical specialities, which are over here and represent 11%, but also motor vehicles, and we have the aerospace uh, and industrial machinery and electrical equipment. So again, a very varied use, even though we, we often talk about the, the medical equipment, they, they represent a relatively small share. And the last thing I want to highlight in our mapping is about uh, what we did with our, our colleague Juan, uh, which is about trying to go to this website called the Thingiverse, which is an open source repository, and trying to see the items that are currently being put in that repository, which are 3D printable items, and seeing whether we could use the tags on those items and the descriptions of those items to match into the HS code. So this would get a bit closer to trying to identify that domestic use that is quite different from that industrial use. And what we see is that the share of 3D printable items uh, tend to concentrate in very few product categories. These are categories at the uh, two-digit level and largely related to some of the stuff that, that, that uh, Martina mentioned uh, earlier. Um, this is something that we haven't done very much with in the paper. It's much more explained in the paper, but uh, we think that this is an avenue for future research that might be relatively uh, interesting. Um, let me finish with telling you a bit about what we did in terms of the empirical analysis, where we were looking at the links between adoption of 3D printing and uh, trade in goods. Um, in terms of the literature, I want to highlight that on the empirical side, there was a paper by Leering in 2017, which really raised the alarm and was picked up by the media quite a lot. And it suggested that 3D printing could reduce trade by as much as 22% by 2060. And so many people just, you know, raised their hands and said, oh my God, this is, we should be really scared. Incidentally, those uh, estimates were reviewed in 2021 to 4.5 by 2040. So, so substantially different estimates for, for different periods of time. I think maybe taking into account different assumptions, but it goes to show how difficult it is to do analysis in this area. We have work by Cavadena and Laperti that, that used patent statistics and showed that the adoption of 3D printing correlated with higher domestic value added in exports and machinery equipment sectors. 
There's the excellent work of Abelansky and co-authors, which used gravity models to map uh, 3D printing trade, uh, identifying that it's most important in large economies with high transport costs, and providing some initial correlations between adoption of 3D printers and uh, imports of hearing aids. And then, I mean, I would call the gold standard uh, analytically the work by Freund and, and co-authors who adopted a, a really uh, good difference in difference and synthetic control approach uh, to looking at the issue of 3D printing adoption and hearing aids, finding really strong impacts that the adoption you know, led to a 58% increase in exports and 104% increase in, in imports. They also did a bit of work with uh, that uh, database uh, that I was mentioning uh, earlier of 3D printing industrial goods and also found uh, some positive uh, relationship between adoption and, and, and printing. They, they were sort of toying with the idea that the impact should play across uh, the weight of what was being uh, 3D printed. And so the weight would play a, a relatively uh, so building on this really good literature, we sort of set out to model the links between imports of 3D printers and exports of 3D printed items. Um, one of the channels of transmission being imported 3D printers. And we based this on a production function where the determinants of exports of 3D printable items are related to past performance, uh, taking into account sort of export persistence, uh, structural parameters, which are related to supply capacity, uh, are in the expenditure and uh, per capita GDP, measures of adoption of 3D printing technology through measures of imports of 3D printers using a different, well, that code that, that we mentioned uh, earlier and some proxy measures of that code, and then uh, controls for overall import demand so that we could control for the prevailing trade policy environment and also confounding factors such as determinants of imports that may affect export performance uh, as well. In the world of global value chains, we know that, that you can't uh, export without import. So we wanted to control for a whole set of, of things as well. And we used a dynamic uh, model, system GMM, uh, to help deal with endogeneity. We chose lags uh, to remove uh, serial correlation. And we played around with all the instrument uh, validity tests, uh, which you can see in the paper in the, in the now the results, uh, what you'll see is that we, we carried out the estimation across two time periods from 2002 to 2018. And what we saw is that there was no impact for the entirety of the period 2002 to 2018. And that we only identified an impact of 3D printer imports and 3D printable exports uh, for the period 2010 to 2018, which sort of makes a lot of sense having shown you that sort of evolution where it was only in the later 2010 and thereafter period where the technology became uh, much more in use. In terms of the quantifying the impact, the elasticity is relatively small, but when you evaluate it at the mean, you actually get quite a sizable impact. That is the increase in, in, in 14,000 US dollars of imports of 3D printers can lead to an increase in 3.3 uh, million of exports of 3D printable goods. So a, a sizable increase there. Uh, we found differences in higher tech products. Uh, so much higher impacts for higher tech uh, products, the orthopedic appliances and, and the uh, aircraft parts. And we also run a barrage of robustness checks, uh, whether using alternative models, instrument reduction, different measures of exports of 3D printing uh, items and of imports of uh, 3D printers. And we ran a range of placebo tests to make sure that our variable was capturing what we thought it was capturing. And these results were, were relatively robust to all of these. So let me finish just by saying what we learned from, from all of this. Um, I think the first thing is that a better understanding of the technical features of 3D printing really helps focus the trade policy discussion. We tend to, uh, when we're looking at new technologies, always go with the hype and forget to take sort of maybe a more paused view. We've done it for AI, we've done it for blockchain, we've done it for 3D printing. And so perhaps, you know, we need to take a bit more time to understand what the technology is capable of doing before we sort of jump into, into the hype. Um, there is a lot of progress in this area. I've cited a few papers and Darwin, we hope, contributes to the literature. 
Uh, but one of the key challenges continues to be statistics. There's very little statistics on, on 3D printing uh, adoption in particular. We use imports. We also looked at various indicators using Google Trends data to see whether we could identify. Uh, but it was a bit difficult to, to, to make sure that we are actually uh, having the right instrument for, for what we need. Um, and the last thing I want to highlight, well, the second last thing I want to highlight is that these concerns raised on the substitution of uh, physical trade um, are perhaps a little uh, far-fetched. And these are really important because we are currently discussing the moratorium on customs duties on electronic transmissions. And this was supposed to be discussed at MC12, which has now been postponed. But many are saying, well, 3D printing changes everything because it means that everything's going to be 3D printed. And so we're going to lose even more revenue at least on what our analysis says and what the World Bank analysis also says is that this is not entirely true and that those concerns might be for now premature, but also important to note that we should watch out for this space. The technology is evolving and it can evolve fast, So it's not just because we're not concerned today and tomorrow in the next five or 10 years, but in the future, who knows what development might come from this. Um, in terms of the way forward, as I mentioned earlier, the, the measurement stuff is really, really important. And one of the things that we want to get a better handle of, and I mentioned adoption, it's also where in the services statistics would 3D printable items fall and how would they be captured? And that's going to matter when we're doing empirical analysis, uh, but it's also going to matter for market access issues because we're, we're much freer in terms of uh, our rules on, on, on goods than we are on, on services. And the last thing is maybe some more work needs to be done on this distinction between household use and industry use, which is likely to matter. Uh, and in particular, I mean, for me, the, what, what comes to mind is that, you know, if you're using this type of technology to repair, then, you know, you're not necessarily substituting something, you're giving something a longer life. So who knows what the channels of transmission are, whereas in industry, it'd be interesting to know how uh, there'll be a greater move towards certain specialized uses of, of 3D printing technology that might be different from those that we're seeing in households. Um, one last thing is to leave you with further reading. Uh, I want to give a shout out to one of the pioneering papers and uh, done by, by someone that was in the chat, I think, who's in this, uh, in this webinar, which is uh, Magnus Rensson, which uh, I like to claim is my Yoda master. Uh, I, I tend to write loads of papers. Uh, then realizing that he's written a really good one five years ago and that maybe sometimes I, should, I shouldn't have bothered. But i uh, just like to say that he, the, the National Board of Trade in Sweden did a really excellent paper in 2016. There's the work of uh, Caroline Freund and co-authors and the work of Abelanski that's really good. And also the work of the WEF um, in 2020, uh, which is about providing sort of a, also a primer They've been really nice talking to us and, and sharing knowledge of what's going on and making contacts with, with businesses. And the last thing I want to make a shout for is a mystery of the missing papers, which is basically that many of us have and the, the, the list of industrial 3D printed items that we use in our estimation and that the paper by Freund and co-authors use in their estimation is based on this paper. And you can see from the co-authors that there's someone here that might be able to solve this mystery a bit better but this paper in 2017 on additive manufacturing and the fusion of 3d printing provided a really useful list that we have used to check some of the items but we haven't been able to really find the paper so maybe ben can say a bit more about that um let me leave it at that thank you very much Excellent presentation. Thank you so much, both of you, for that. Uh, I love how you guys prepped this so that you could do it in conjunction. That was really, really great to uh, mix up the theory and sort of the desk research with the really juicy um, stuff from, from um, the weeds. So thank you so much for that. I also love thingology, which is a new uh, uh, word for me uh, and that that we needed that we getting an e a hs code that's something for the nerds out there i saw that clock radio will is going to be uh, retired uh, and thank you very much to all those who are coming um, you know students who are here today um, i asked specifically for the literature review for them so thank you so much all this will be posted on the website i am going to hand it over to ben so that he can both solve um, the mystery. And uh, if you guys want to take a look at the questions that have come in, 
too, so that we can get them. Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Hannah. And uh, thanks, guys, for such a great uh, presentation. It's a really nice model to have it kind of in interwoven like that. I, I, I really, really got a lot out of that. Um, you know, given where Javier left the presentation, I feel like I should solve the mystery of, of the missing paper. So this was work that we did in 2017. Um, it's an exploratory piece uh, talking about, I think, many of the issues that we've talked about today and how they might play out. Although we were doing it with a lot less knowledge, I think the lot knowledge base has built up uh, a lot over the last four years. Um, and we did come up with this list of products um, I, I should say, given how we did it, you know, we simply went through the SITC uh, with a, a sort of economist's understanding of what the technology looks like. And we said, OK, we think this can be 3D printed and we think this can't. Um, so that people are relying on that list of products, um, I think, indicates that that would be a great space in which to do some more work. And I like the figure that you put up, Javier, with uh, you know, going to that uh, online repository of designs and, and actually sort of mapping that out in a much more rigorous way than, uh, that, than we were able to do. But the, the paper is missing simply because the World Bank didn't publish it. Um, so, you know, you've given me renewed incentive to go and bug my co-authors at the World Bank to try and get this thing out there. And, and you know, if I can tell them that people are actually using it and kind of wondering where it is, uh, then, then hopefully they'll be uh, in, incentivized to do that. But you know, that, that's, uh, let, let me just leave that and kind of come back to the, some, some of the questions uh, that, that I, I had from the presentation. And, you know, I think one that came up in the chat that I really liked was that, you know, we, we had this graph about sort of the business reality of uh, the adoption of 3D printing and kind of what the cost curve looks like. And we can talk a little bit more about uh, that, that cost curve and some of the particular implications that it has in particular types of trade. Uh, in a moment. But one other thing I wanted to ask is about the role of public policy. And I think there are two ways in which we could imagine public policy interventions having an effect on the rate of adoption of 3D printing. One is the point that I think uh, uh, Martina may have raised that uh, the, the level of waste is so fundamentally different uh, between traditional manufacturing and additive manufacturing. Um, I think the figure of cutting it down by up to 90% uh, was, was put out there. So, you know, given that that's the case, are we going to hear calls for environmental regulation uh, to make it sort of more favorable for people to adopt 3D printing simply on environmental grounds? Then the second policy issue that came up is the shift that we see in at least rhetoric in some of the higher income countries towards uh, reshoring or at least nearshoring, that is to say, uh, using regional uh, links rather than global links. And are we going to see that kind of play a role as well? So uh, maybe, maybe since, since Javier was doing most of the talking, maybe if I ask Martina to respond first and then we can move to, to Javier after that. Sure, thanks. Um, so first of all, I, um, regarding in general, the um, I, I can talk, I, talking about the makers movement specifically, one thing to mention is that uh, the maker movement, which I think is the main user of 3D printers in the world, so <laughs> that's why I, uh, I'm referring to it, uh, is uh, very conscious of the environment. So uh, we never use plastic, for example, is always uh, uh, PLA, which is a type of plastic, which is uh, biodegradable. And, uh, and I think uh, there is, uh, in general, this uh, uh, interest and, and, and always consciousness about the environment, about avoiding waste. waste. And there is also the idea of reshoring in the sense of uh, um, yeah, bringing, bringing the, the actual production of our, of our product near to the customer and avoid in this way, in, in this way also waste uh, for, for inventory, for example. So there is this uh, uh, general understanding. Um, and just adding on policy in general, I think I'm, I'm very surprised uh, when I see uh, countries trying to restrict 3D printing. Uh, I was in Brazil um, uh, doing volunteering work in a, a fab lab, in a makerspace, and there they had huge troubles to get 3D, printed, uh, 3D printers fixed because they have uh, restrictions at the border. Uh, so they were required to just use local 3D printers, which were not good. So when they were sending 3D printers to be fixed in the US, uh, they, at the customs, they were asking them to pay 
double uh, tariffs as, as, as it was a new product or they were just blocking it at the customs. And then in our database that we are building at the UI on digital trade restrictions, so we found uh, Pakistan, uh, Thailand, um, and Brazil to have restrictions at the border so that you need the extra uh, license uh, requirements or just uh, certification by the government to import 3D printers. And I think this is a huge waste of uh, uh, also productivity for the country because you're just obliging the uh, local uh, manufacturers to rely on local 3D printers, which probably are not the most efficient, especially in these countries. Um, and just uh, adding uh, on, on the policy side, then I finish here. Um, in general, there are problems uh, uh, and, and obstacles that uh, are not uh, allowing 3D printing to uh, be uh, and, and, and expand at its, in, at its full speed. Um, and these are problems that we have been discussing uh, for a few years and they're still out there in terms of uh, certifications of 3D printed products. Mm -hmm. um, for example, when it comes to medical products, still there's a lot of discussion. The new European Directive on Medical Devices is trying to take into account 3D printed prosthetics, uh, but it's uh, doing it in a very bad way. Um, the, the, there are some countries like the US, Australia, UK are doing very good job in trying to certify 3D printing, 3D printed products for medical use. Um, but in countries like uh, Italy, for example, we are having huge uh, issues as the response to the COVID pandemic uh, showed, um, and also issues of liability of uh, uh, where does the liability lie uh, when it comes to um, a broken uh, 3D printed product, especially when it is used uh, in a person, <laughs> like in, in the case of prosthetics, is it about the material, the 3D printer, uh, the 3D model, uh, the doctor printing the stuff, or the doctor putting the stuff. So it, it, there's a huge discussion and uh, I think the fact that there is no clarity and the states are not doing anything about providing clarity on these topics is uh, uh, preventing 3D printing to, to really show its, its full uh, uh, benefits uh, in, in applications. Yeah, I think these are all great points. Do you, Javier, how do you see it playing out in, in the policy space? Well, I mean, going to maybe the, the question about waste, uh, just noting that, that uh, Magnus noted in the chat about uh, the high toxicity, the toxicity of the material. And there is a great report that was done uh, by uh, the OECD on 3D printing and the environmental implications. It wasn't done by, by me or, or in my uh, in our di director, but somewhere else. Um, but I guess the thing I wanted to highlight is like with most of these things, we need to focus on the entirety of the value chain of 3D printing. And so it is about the material. You are burning sometimes plastic and, and things like that, and that's going to create problems. Um, it will save in terms of travel. You don't have to, you know, send things across the world, and so that's a sort of uh, saving part. But you do have to send material, and you do have to extract more material. So again, that provides a whole set of new emissions that are generated perhaps elsewhere. Um, uh, the energy that is used, uh, I you know, I don't know how efficiently the energy is being used relative to other manufacturing processes. And sort of that might be a thing because you are heating things, whereas maybe the other thing you're just cutting things. Heating and to very high temperatures could be very energy consumption. And then the last thing is the use as well. You know, if we're able to 3D print, we might be 3D printing a lot more than we would have bought. So I would call for a bit of a a cautious analysis of the environmental implications that look through these things that don't just look at, you know, well, yes, we save a bit of money here. Actually, we need to really start doing the full set of environmental analysis. And um, quickly in terms of sort of the reshoring uh, question, um, I mean, for me, given what we found from the technology, um, I'm not too concerned. I, I think that the technology, as I've said, when we started is a really, really cool technology. It does really nice stuff, but you're not going to be able to suddenly, you know, reshore entire value chains. There are still cost advantages to global value chains, and there are a limited amount of things that you can produce via 3D printing. A lot of them are in the consumable sort of uh, categories. We're not going to 3D print uh, mobile phones anytime soon, and there's still that unit cost advantages. So, while I think the technology is very cool and especially useful in terms of 
ensuring that there is resilience in value chains so that you can find substitutes perhaps for some of the intermediates. There's loads of cases in COVID-19 uh, that Martina might want to talk about as well on, on uh, nasal swabs and parts of, of respirators, loads of examples out there. I don't think it's going to be the way of producing this. Nasal swabs are still better produced in very high quantities from somewhere else and then shipped over. Um, so, I mean, I would say that, and then maybe later on I can come back on a question on the on the moratorium, uh, which is very dear to me, uh, having done a, a lot of work on this and, and what the implications are. Yeah, maybe uh, we, we can just have a lead into that, because I, I think, you know, the other kind of public policy aspect of this that's really important is the distributional one. And, you know, when I read a paper like the, the, the World Bank paper that, that you referenced, you know, the, the Caroline Freund and, and co-authors uh, paper, you know, they're, they're basically focusing on, uh, you know, most of the paper is focusing on, on one market in one country, which is hearing aids in Mexico. And, you know, you see this increase in trade, which I, I've got to admit, I found a little surprising. And then I thought, well, no, if the cost reduction is significant enough, you can see value going up through through a, a, a you know an, an income effect basically so you know I can I can see how that works but then you know I was fascinated when you put up that graph of uh, the countries that you see importing 3d printers and of course you see many traditional manufacturers Mexico among them but then I also noted India and I noted Nigeria and of course both of these countries have manufacturing bases but they're not particularly competitive. Uh, globally in most manufacturing sectors. So, you know, are they following kind of the Mexico model where they're importing 3D printers, getting a cost advantage in some sort of customizable uh, 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 item, and then actually exporting this in a way that they uh, perhaps haven't uh, exported so much in the past? Or is it because they have large domestic markets and so they're primarily serving the domestic market? And so, you know, I, I guess the, you know, the, the, the policy big picture question goes to you, Javier, and then Martina, maybe you'd like to chip in because I know you've done some work, you were talking about uh, uh, some of the, the fab labs in Africa and just have a better sense of kind of what they're actually doing with the technology once they've got it. So uh, Javier, you, you first, maybe. So, so the way that I talk about this to, to friends and to, to, to people is that, you know, you think of 3D printing either as a sort of a manufacturing technology or as a distribution technology. So I see 3D printing in many instances as a productivity enhancing technology. It allows you to do new things in at lower costs. And so when you adopt it in that sense, then the implications for international trade are, are, are not that big. And I have to highlight that uh, whether it's 3D printers, but also a lot of things on digital, uh, many countries or most countries access these technologies that are foundational to production through international trade. So for me, what's really important that Martina alluded to this is to keep the international trade channels open so that this technology can be, let's say, democratized and, uh, and used everywhere. I mean, think about mobile phones, you know, mobile phones are, and, and laptops are, are concentrated where they're produced, but they're bought nearly everywhere and they underpin a lot of services activities in terms of receiving services and delivering services. Well, 3D printing to a certain extent is the same. There is going to be a concentration of 3D printing as patents run out, there's going to be sort of like a bit less concentration and diffusion, but you need the trade channel in order to ensure that uh, people can, can benefit from this. And for me, it's especially important in, in countries which, you know, do not have domestic substitutes for this. Uh, now, the trouble is, is that in many countries, they keep very high tariffs on these products, which makes it prohibitive to import them. And then there are the issues about the skills. You can't develop the skills that are needed to produce these. So I get a bit worried sometimes by not having open markets, which essentially means that you can't access the technology, which essentially means that you start at a disadvantage in this production revolution. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mar Martina, maybe if I throw to you for, I think what's gonna be pretty close to our last word, what, what do you see going on with 3D printing in, uh, you know, in, in a region like, like Africa? How is the technology being used on the ground? Uh, well, uh, I'm not an expert about Africa, just uh, I, I know something uh, and, and just wanted to, wanted to add on uh, Javier's point that I really also don't see how uh, 3D printing can change and shape trade patterns of 
anything like this is just a starting point so i with all this discussion about uh, the moratorium i really don't see the point and actually i'm afraid that uh, can prevent uh, uh, businesses and people from making use of a technology that uh, is uh, actually very interesting for creating innovative solution prototyping new stuff uh, developing skills in schools and so i i really uh, also will uh, switch from uh, hating it and being scared to loving it uh, because yeah I think that's the most reasonable <laughs> feeling that you can have about 3D printing um, and regarding Africa for what I know um, um, the, the maker spaces and fab labs that they've been created in this region are mainly uh, aiming at developing skills uh, and, uh, and supporting proto prototyping of, uh, of solutions and, and solving local issues because uh, sometimes it's very hard also to get things shipped over to fix small stuff. So that's what it is really about. So it's not really revolutionizing anything, but it's helping to solve problems at the local level that maybe are harder to solve there uh, compared to the EU in, uh, or yeah, other developing, developed countries. Okay, thanks. I, I noticed we've, we've gone a couple of minutes over time. I think there's tons more that, that we could discuss, but maybe if I just hand back to, to Hannah to close this out. Yeah, amazing webinar. Thank you so very, very much. There's so much that I have learned here. Yeah, um, uh, so for me, the question is always, you know, what, what would we tell policymakers? Um, for those who have been deep diving into something, I always want to know what do we tell policymakers and um, what is the one thing that we didn't know? Well, I think you've answered those questions really well. So for policymakers, we need to make sure that you keep the lines open. Uh, this is not a threat. Um, so if there's one thing that you want to learn about this, it's that you want to dive into it and you want to learn more because it is an enhancing technology and it, it's a win-win. Um, and the other thing is that there's no HS code for it and we need a lot more data um, that I think are the two main uh, issues. I, I hope that I got it right. Um, yes. All right. Excellent. My question then to you guys is, can people connect with you on LinkedIn, for example, and continue the conversation if they have questions? Is that all right? Um, Absolutely. And, 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 really encouraged. <laughs> excellent. Uh, we want to make sure that you know people here at the forum get as much out of you as possible. Um, with that said, thank you very, very much, everyone who came in today. Uh, and uh, of course, Javier and Martina, who have taken this to a brand new level for us, uh, synchronizing their presentations, amazing. Uh, and to Ben, as always, for pulling this together. And to Ben, because, da 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 yes next, ne next time so we we mentioned right right at the beginning that the next uh webinar uh will be on january 20th um and we're going to be talking gravity modeling so uh you know we we focused on having policy uh presentations as as part of uh tprf's uh kind of main function uh, i use gravity modeling for policy work it's it's not an academic exercise and i've actually been working on a little booklet, uh, it's not long enough to actually call a book. It's it's very much a kind of how do you do it uh, for practitioners, and importantly, how do you get it right, and how do you avoid uh, some of the mistakes that that people commonly make, and of course that I used to make in in, in the past because we're all uh, learning about this as we go. Um, so we're going to be talking about tips and traps for practitioners in gravity modelling on January twentieth at the usual time, nine a.m. Uh, Eastern. And we're going to add an, an AMA, uh, an ask me anything uh, portion. So if you work on gravity modeling, if you've got a paper, uh, bring your questions along and put them in chat and I'll try and respond as best uh, I, I can in the time that we've got. So uh, again, thanks to our presenters today. I think that was a really fantastic presentation. Uh, like Hannah, I learned so much from it. Um, so I really do appreciate uh, the time and effort that you put into it. And we look forward to seeing everyone again uh, after the holidays on January 20th. Thank you. Yeah, so happy holidays, everyone, and see you next year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. <laughs>